camera on. So just so for the folks on the call here, my name is Joe Ricker. I'm a senior uh, technical principal with WSP. I am based in WSP's Memphis, Tennessee office, and I'll be talking about groundwater plume analytics tools for evaluating remediation effectiveness at contaminated sites. So just real quick, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, I believe uh, the presentation is available. It's in the handouts folder. And then also there will be time for questions when this is over. I think you can type questions into the chat box. So <clears throat> with that, um, uh, we'll, like I said, open up for questions when I'm done, but I will get started. I'm gonna turn my camera off to preserve bandwidth here and I will get started. So let me jump into this. So the idea of analytics that we use for um, evaluating remedial effectiveness is, is just comes from this word. It's a buzzword, pretty common in our industry. But the idea with analytics is taking complex data that we collect at our contaminated sites and then distilling those data into you know, meaningful outputs or to communicate insight, using the visualization to communicate what's going on at these contaminated sites. So what I'll talk about really are just four tools. Now we have a whole lot more than this, but the four I want to focus on, I will show you a, a case study, an example that illustrates the use of these four tools. The first one is the Ricker Method Plume Stability Analysis, and that's that's pretty much the platform of our analytics tools, and that is a method I developed years ago. It is published. It is in the public domain. Uh, a lot of folks use it, but the idea is taking data from groundwater data from our sites and using those data to to present or to calculate groundwater plume maps looking at metrics within a plume of area average concentration and mass and then center of mass and seeing how those behave you know over time that's really what the Ricker method does and so other tools we'll look at are the spatial change indicator which is really a way to evaluate spatial changes through time and again you'll see this much clearer with the presentation or with the case study I'll show you here in a minute. And then the remediation system benefit analysis or RSBA, what this does, it helps answer the question. So let's say you've got a site with a groundwater treatment system. One thing I'll note in our industry, we are really good it seems like at turning systems on. Sometimes we're not quite as adept or, or as good sometimes at knowing when to turn them off. And so this tool was designed to help answer that question. Can we use our data to evaluate, does it make sense to go into a pilot shutdown? So it helps answer the question, you know, if your plume is decreasing, is it decreasing because of or in spite of the pumping? And helping to answer that helps us understand if we can turn a system off um, going forward. And then the last tool I'll, I'll highlight today is the well sufficiency analysis. And that's really geared more towards optimization. How do we reduce a well network in a meaningful way that can be presented to a regulatory agency that makes sense and help them understand that? So those are the four tools I'll, I'll focus on. There are other tools, again, but, but I'll focus on those four. So just a real quick high level, where do we use Plume Analytics? Pretty much the answer is any site that has groundwater data from which you can generate a groundwater contaminant plume. So if you can do that, these tools are probably applicable. You see a lot of the different industries we've worked in, almost probably, gosh, as many contaminant classes and compounds that are the most common out there, we've done it for. So, um, you know, just for example, pulp and paper, uh, we've done creosote, naphthalene, PAHs, pentachlorophenol. You know, our biggest grouping of compounds really is chlorinated solvents. So looking at parent-daughter sequences, breakdowns, things like that, even nuclear. So we've got sites where we're doing gross alpha, gross beta, technetium 99. We're looking at data in picocuries per liter. So any site that has groundwater data, you know, we can generate plume maps from, we can do analysis for. We even do sites that have pH plumes and ORP plumes, just looking at anything we can, we can evaluate behavior of groundwater um, using different types of uh, CAO contaminant data. So what I'll do is I'll walk into an example. I think that's the best way to illustrate, <clears throat> excuse me, illustrate these tools is using a site study. <clears throat> so this site is a, it's a, it's in California, in the U.S. and is a bulk terminal. It's it's a, a petroleum storage facility. Now the key challenges here were, you know, lots of data. They've got data stemming back into the 90s, and how can we use the data to understand what the remedial progress is at the site? They've got four different remediation systems ongoing at the site in 2019 when we did the analysis. Uh, 
again, multiple systems looking for ways to shut down some of those systems if possible. And then can they monitor, or I'm sorry, can they optimize the network? Are there ways we can, you know, reduce the number of wells we're looking at, reduce the frequency? You know, can we do that going forward? And all of this was really under the umbrella of sustainable remediation. Can we do this in a sustainable way? Look at reducing environmental footprint, you know, really hitting those sustainable goals that the, the client had for their, for their organization. So what I'll do, jump into the case study. What you're looking at now is a groundwater plume map. This is benzene. So this site has two zones, an A zone and a B zone. We're just gonna focus on the A zone for now. And so you can see a, a benzene plume map, nothing really new there that I'm sure everybody on the, on the call has seen before. But what we do, or what the Ricker method does, is we look at these metrics and, and you see these on the bottom here. We look at the aerial extent or the footprint of the plume. We look at the average concentration, which is a spatial integration over the plume, and then we can use those two metrics to come up with a mass estimate, or we call it a mass indicator, to get a sense of how that's behaving through time. We also look at the center of mass. You see that in the middle of the plume here. So what I'll do is I'll just play this forward, and you can see data back into the early 90s, lots of data. As time goes on, you see a lot of wells get added. Wells come in as this plume continues to go on. There's no remediation yet. That doesn't start till 2001. You see a bunch of gray wells come in. Some of these are extraction wells, some of these are soil vapor extraction, some are dual phase extraction, some are O2 injection. You see a lot of these gray wells come in. These are all different remediation systems that come in through time. And then we get this to the very end. So <laughs> close to 30 years of data. Imagine looking at 30 years of data in a report. It'd be very cumbersome. I just showed it to you in 30 seconds, how the plume is behaving. And you can see that very, and this is where regulators really like to see how a plume is behaving. So we visualize it first, you can see what's going on. And now what we'll do is look at the metrics. We'll look at the trends in these metrics. So the trend in plume area is on the top, average concentration in the middle, mass indicator on the bottom. And we do a statistical analysis on the behavior of the data since remediation started. So you can see for area, very strong decreasing trend. We evaluate these trends using man Kendall and regression very high confidence, same thing with concentration, same thing with mass. So very clearly you could see it in the data, that plume got smaller over time, and now we can do it objectively. You know, we, we absolutely have decreasing, statistically significant decreasing trends in these metrics. Very strong way to evaluate. So yes, we can understand that this plume is in fact remediating, it's getting smaller, all those great things. The next thing we look at is the center of mass. So how did the center of mass behave over that period of time? And you can see it's color coded. Darker colors are earlier data, lighter colors are more recent data. And you can see a general migration of the center of mass at this site to the east. You can just kind of track it with your eyes here to the east. Groundwater flow at this site is to the west. So this is an up gradient shift in the center of mass through time. Again, a really strong, stable signature. Even more than that, you look at the chart on the right here. If you can imagine center of mass at one location, at the next sampling event, it's at a new location. Connect those two locations with an arrow. Mathematically, that's a vector. And we can plot the vector movements over here. And what you see is what I call a shotgun pattern. And all that means is the center of mass is never always going in the same direction. I've seen plumes where it's growing and the center of mass is continually moving in the same direction in the downgrading direction. We don't see that here. We see a, you know just a back and forth random movement but a bulk shift through time to the east. Again, very strong way to look at that. This is more of a secondary plume stability metric, but again, a strong way to evaluate plume behavior. Um, this plume is clearly decreasing. So the, the next tool I wanna show you here is what we call the spatial change indicator. That's one of the tools I mentioned earlier where we look at spatial changes through time. So for this, we're gonna compare every single plume map to a baseline plume map. So um, a lot of times people will compare, you know, qualitatively two plume maps side by side. We're going to look at them spatially, you know, dive into the data underneath it. So we're going to subtract each plume from the baseline plume and have a resultant on the right. Anywhere the concentrations decrease in the subsequent plume, it shows up over here as blue. Anywhere it increases, it shows up over here as red. The gradational shading gives you the relative change of increase or decrease respectively. The darkest blue is 100% decrease. You can kind of check that. You see where there's plume up here. You don't see it here, it's gone. It's 100% gone, that's the darkest blue. But you see a lot of dark blue here, some red in here. So this lets you see through time as I animate this, 
how the changes are in the plume over time. We also have a quantitative component to this as well. On the bottom, you can see the amount of change in area, concentration, and mass on a percent basis. We can also look at the magnitude of change. So all of the blue is a decrease. We can quantify that. You see that in pounds down here. All the red is an increase, and we can quantify that as well. So just a tremendous amount of information that can be gathered from this simple uh, graphic. And that's the idea. It's a simple graphic. You can see what's going on. That's what analytics is, taking lots of data and understanding. So as I play this, you can see there's some sourcing in the tank farm area. See the red? It gets redder and it stays red. But then as the remediation comes in, it begins to go away. And we see that blue, that attenuation signature, what I really love to see. You see lots of blue around these remediation systems, just showing you qualitatively that there's a pretty big decrease around there. What I like to see here is also the dark blue along the periphery of the plume, 100% decrease. You can really see how that plume is getting smaller. This also illustrates another phenomenon very common in our industry. So instead of looking at just plume area, which is a fine metric, but it never tells the full story. So here we see the area decreased by 41%. That's pretty good. Look at the mass. It decreased by 94%. Very strong decrease within the plume. So really diving in and evaluating more data that we have available to us to look at behavior. And this tool is great when doing, say, you know, injections or remediation. How does the plume respond? you know, in response to remediation? How does the plume behave in response to some remediation effort? And you can see, use this tool to evaluate that. This tool is also very useful for evaluating sourcing at a site. You see that red and it goes redder and redder. You can really pinpoint where a plume is growing relative to where it's attenuating or decreasing. So again, very strong way to look at that. So same site, but as I play this again, there these are the four remediation systems on the site. So let's focus on just this one. Let's say I want to focus on what's going on just inside this part of the site, and I want to look at that remediation system. You could see some wells come in initially, a second set of wells comes in over here, and then eventually you'll see a bunch of dual-phase extraction wells get installed here. So 2011, you see, boom, a bunch of two-phase extraction wells come in. So let's say I want to evaluate progress just inside that window, just inside that polygon. Well, we can do that as well. If I draw that polygon there and look into it, this is the trend, these are the patterns just inside that polygon. And you can see, you know, in the early data, there wasn't much there. Here's that first expansion, here's that second network expansion. And over time, it decreases. You can see when they installed the dual phase extraction system, kind of zoom in on this, and you see the dual phase extraction took it down to near zero. Turn the system off. There's no rebound. Showing this to a regulator is a great way to show that this system has done its job. It's not doing any additional benefit. Let's turn it off. This was approved. This, this is a way to evaluate shutdown of a system, and you can just look at just where that system has influence. So the um, let's. I've got a question here. Okay. Um, so I'll go to the next slide here, and you can see, let's look at one of these other systems. We look at the system on the northern part, and you can see here, uh, highlight on that particular system, and we want to see just how that one is behaving. And we just look at that, and you can see the different behavior in that part of the plume. Different parts of the plume behave differently. So what I want to do now is what I'll end on is just looking at an optimization. How do we take this site? How can we use the data to um, uh, reduce a network? And so the same exact site data, same exact system, same exact plume. I, I don't have to play this because you've already seen it. But what we're going to do now is try to um, you know, remove wells from the network but still have the ability to evaluate progress. So what I'll do, these are the trends. You've already seen the, the video. Here are the trends and the data. They look a little bit different because we're going to make some comparisons. So what I'll do is we're going to focus on just the last five years of data. How did the plume behave in just those last five years with all wells in the network? So we zoom in on that last five-year period, and then what we'll do is we're going to come back and we're going to remove wells from the network as if they never existed. So these wells in purple have been removed as if they never existed. 
and we simply rerun the analysis. Can we tell the same story? Can we have the same understanding? Can we evaluate progress with 14 wells removed? And so what we do is we compare. Here are the trends with all wells in the network. The orange line, these are the trends with 14 wells removed. One thing you can notice right away, right off the bat, is that our interpretations are the same, our conclusions are the same. We really haven't lost anything in our ability to evaluate behavior, but we can do it with 14 fewer wells. That's pretty big reduction. So we evaluate that. We look at the trends with the original network, the trends with the reduced network. We look at the, uh, the relative percent difference of every paired difference on the line. We wanna uh, minimize that, that RPD. We look at the correlation. They should be correlated to each other. They should be in lockstep. So, um, and again, you see a high correlation. We want to maximize the correlation here. So uh, this is a really good way to, to get to that. You know, we got 14 wells removed, really strong uh, match here. And I think we can go forward. So what we do is we actually take more wells out of the network. For this site, we ended with 27 wells removed. And, uh, you know, the, the, all the wells in purple here have been removed. And so we simply rerun the analysis again. So we're getting into some pretty significant reductions here. You know, 27 wells removed from the system. We go to the end here and look at the, the trends. Here again, trends with all wells in the network. These are the trends with 27 wells removed. That's a 40% reduction. Pretty strong reduction here. You can see that. And the, the match is still really good. We still can tell the progress. This was actually presented. This uh, is the Central Valley Water Board. If you have anyone on the call is familiar, um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me for this site, this site is in Northern California. So uh, this was accepted, this was approved. 40% reduction is a pretty significant savings on a reduced network. Moreover, based on the stability, based on the understanding of plume behavior, we were able to also get a reduction in frequency. We know the plume is stable. We know it's decreasing. We don't have to look at it every six months. And that we were actually able to get to an annual monitoring program too. So there's an additional 50% reduction in O&M cost by going from a semi-annual to an annual monitoring. It, just a, like I said, a very significant reduction here. So um, at the end of the day, some key takeaways for this particular project, you know, very efficient regulatory review process. They can see what's going on. It was so acceptable to them, they actually invited us back. And I did some training for several of the water boards by, by using these tools to show some of their, their folks, their, their project managers, how to, you know, how to use this or how to, to review projects like this. Um, very well accepted. And like I said earlier, basis for shutdown, we were able to shut down two remediation systems by using these tools to evaluate progress and show that they had achieved you know, the maximum ability that that system could achieve. Like I said already also, the, the reduction in wells, we got a 40% reduction. That was just in the A zone. In the B zone, we got closer to a 45% reduction in the number of wells. We also went to annual sampling, so a significant savings, well over $100,000 US um, in O&M costs uh, for this analysis, simply by using the existing data. One thing I didn't mention earlier, th this is not modeling per se, it's, it's empirical analysis of existing data. So the last thing here, and this hit their metric of sustainability, turning off those systems resulted in greater than 99% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and energy. And that's a huge benefit to them and it helps on their, you know, their, their uh, bottom line there. Significant cost reductions clearly. And then even community impact, you know, turning off noisy, loud systems, they're, they're able to clear those areas out. Um, fewer site visits, fewer, fewer interruptions to the, to the neighborhood. Very well accepted even by the neighborhood by getting these systems turned off and not having to operate them out, out in those certain neighborhoods. So a really high um, evaluation. I wanted to hit this real quick before we go to questions. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg of the tools that are available. I do encourage you, please reach out, email me, call me. Um, there are so many other applications of the groundwater plume analytics tools doing mass flux and discharge, potential metric data. I didn't show it here, but we did it at this site, looking at how the potential metric data changes through time, correlating it to trends in the, in the dissolved data, 
uh, the chlorinated VOCs. We do a lot actually with, with molar fraction analysis, parent-daughter sequences, attenuation rates of parents and daughters. Really fantastic way to see plume-wide how these plumes are degrading, the, the chlorinateds especially. In fact, I've done quite a bit of litigation support using those tools for chlorinated sites. Um, uh, so again, risk assessment, conceptual site models, what's going on, how do I really take all the data from a site and put it into a package that's easy to see and understand. Really great from that perspective. So what I'll do is I will I will pause here or I will stop talking and I think we can take uh, questions. I'll put my webcam back on and um, put it over to you, um, Sharon. Yes, hi Joe. Thank you. Apologies before I lost my audio. So happy to be back. <laughs> I saw that. I was hoping. <laughs> Apologies for this. Um, yeah. So uh, just to remind you, housekeeping items uh, in the presentation is available to download in the handout box, and also feel free to ask questions in the question box. We will be reading them now. I will start with the first question we received from the US. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the Plume Analytics tool compared to other programs like the Shell Oil? Uh, GWS DAT? Yeah, great question, Sharon. So the GWS DAT, um, it, it uses a slightly different algorithm, but it does do the similar metrics. In fact, if you go to the documentation for the GWS DAT, it does reference the Ricker method as the basis for those metrics. So they're looking at similar metrics a slightly different way. Um, the GWS DAT, however, is not, I don't think, quite as visual. It doesn't give you the visual aspect to it. It doesn't put it in a package that's easy to see with animations and all of those things that I've showed you here. The other things it cannot do is because it doesn't have the patent for it, and that's like the spatial change indicator. Those you cannot do with the GWS DAT. Um, and I don't think the GWS DAT has the ability to look at molar fractions and ratios throughout a plume as well, which is another thing we do. Just didn't have time to show it today. But um, th there are limitations in that regard. But the, the other thing about G GWS DAT, it's free. <laughs> So if you want to go in and use it, more power to you. But um, it, it, I don't think it has the, it's not as powerful visually and getting the point across than, it, than, it, than the, what I showed you today is. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Um, how can we optimize the number of wells at an early stage? So that's going to be a tricky one um, because this is empirical analysis. It's based on empirical data. So it's based on the data you've collected already. So uh, you can always do well sufficiency analysis based on an existing network. So if you're early in remediation, this may not be the best application for an early application of reductions. But once you've established, you know, multiple events, maybe, I don't know, seven, eight events for a certain network, evaluate it at that point and then start reducing from there. So you, you need to build the data, data network before you can look at it to evaluate it and how effective it was. I hope that makes sense. This is not a predictive analysis. It's not a predictive model in any way. So it, it is entirely dependent on the empirical data. Thank you. What is the minimum number of data points, uh, the number of wells or the number of sample events? So, yeah, I get that question a lot. So you can do this. A lot of these, you know, you can create a plume map on one data set. But the idea is looking at relative changes through time. So I know we actually wrote guidance for the state of Missouri, and we recommended when doing a site analysis, looking at plume stability for closure at a site, we would recommend eight events. So at least eight that are at least quarterly. You can't go every week, eight weeks of data. <laughs> you know, it has to be at least quarterly. Eight events is pretty much the minimum to evaluate a site for closure. But, um, you know, really statistically, I would want probably at least four, event, four events before you can start really applying statistical tools to it. Um, as far as the number of wells, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's more of an art than a science here. And what I like to say with that is, if you have enough wells that you can, you know, pass the red face test, <laughs> uh, create a groundwater plume, you know, based on the number of wells you have in the network, it's probably sufficient to do this type of analysis. So clearly, if you've got a 100-acre site with five wells, that's not enough, you know. Um, but it's, it's really more of a, a professional judgment. You know, do you have enough that you feel you can adequately evaluate? One other thing, actually a good point along those lines is 
depending on your aquifer matrix. If it's sand and gravel, you know, there's a, it's, it's, it's more homogeneous. It's not homogeneous, but it's more homogeneous than say fractured bedrock, which has a lot of anisotropy, a lot of, you know, preferential pathways. You would want more wells. Clearly the more fractures, the more, uh, the more information you would need for that type of site. So it, again, professional judgment, I think really has to play into this. Thank you. Is the Plum Analytic tool a service that WSP is providing or is it a software for sale? Uh, right now, it is a service we provide. So the Ricker method I mentioned earlier, it is uh, it is in the public domain. It's published. If anybody wants a copy of that, please uh, shoot me an email. I can send it to you um, for people to use. But what we've done is we've written our own software around it to create all the outputs and videos and all of that. So um, it is a service we provide for all of the other tools that I showed. We are, I think, working eventually towards software that will be commercially available. Um, we're not there yet, but right now it is a service we provide. Fantastic, thank you for clarifying. Um, next yeah. question is, uh, how do you handle multiple aquifer uh, units? So I mentioned that briefly for the site I showed you, there's just not enough time to show everything. So if there are multiple aquifer units, we simply run this for multiple, uh, of, uh, we actually run it for each unit. So if we've got an A zone and a B zone, we have the exact same outputs for the A zone, then do it for the B zone. So mass is additive. We can always do a chart at the end that adds the masses to look at the total mass. Uh, so if there's multiple units, I would always rather discretize the analysis by unit. Look at how each unit's um, data behaves. So like I said, we, we have a site we're doing now in Florida that has five aquifer units, five different layers. We just have five zones of analysis that we do. And then at the end, we actually tie them all together to get a total mass because that is additive. Thank you. I will take yep. the last question. Okay. How do regu regulatory agencies view this? So uh, regulatory agencies generally, for the most part, I, I, I can't think of one where it was not applicable or not accepted for use. So um, most of them are very open to it. <laughs> they actually are, are quite pleased with how easy it is to see what's going on. And that's the idea, taking the data we have and um, you know, using the data to show what's going on. So it's, it's most often very well received. Like I said, the work we did in Missouri, they, they hired us to write guidance for them <laughs> using these tools. Uh, other states are the same way. So I've done training for at least uh, four different US EPA regions and more than a dozen states where once we've done an analysis for them, a lot of times they invite us back to do lunch and learn presentations, presentations like this, just to, to help show continuing education of, of how to evaluate data in a meaningful way. So it's like I said, it's very well received by most regulatory agencies. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So thank you, Joe, for your presentation. Do get in touch with Joe via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Thank you very much for your time. We hope to see you in future webinars. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. All right.